Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning on a quite a snowy morning. My name is Maddie Martinson, and I serve as the Discipleship Director here at Marshall UMC. And we are so glad that you are in worship with us, whether you're in person or worshiping with us online. If you're new here, or if this is your first time back in a while, we would invite you to fill out one of these connection cards. They look a little something like this. Uh, And you can find those in your black folders in the pews around you. If you're online, you can find an electronic version of this connection card at our webpage, umcmarshall.org. The Easter extravaganza is coming up fast. On Sunday, April 2nd, after our joint Palm Sunday service, we will be having an Easter egg hunt, uh, among other activities as well, for our young families. And we need your help. We need your help stuffing probably over 2,000 eggs for all the kids in our community uh, to hunt for. So at our coffee house at the north entrance, we have hundreds and thousands of eggs that you can take home to stuff and then return to the church uh, before Wednesday, March 29th. If that is something that you're willing to do, you can take a bag, scoop up some eggs, and take them home. If you would rather donate some candy, that is always welcome as well, or you can do both. We do request that the only thing that go inside the eggs is store-bought candy. So no money, no homemade treats, as well-received as they might be. We want to be, be safe and smart about this. Like I said, you can return all of the stuffed eggs back to the church by Wednesday, March 29th. And when you're returning them, we would ask that you label your container with how many eggs you stuffed. So we can just do some, some simple math to, to count how many that we have by April 2nd. It's going to be a lot of fun. So we thank you for your help in advance. A quick reminder that after the 11 o'clock worship service today, we are having a family way event, a Lego challenge. Michael's excited. Um, We're going to have some fun building and being creative as we learn a Bible story and then recreate that using bricks. Lunch is provided, uh, so all are welcome with uh, young children to, to come and join us. It'll be a lot of fun. Now, if you're able and are willing, would you please stand and join us in our opening hymn, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty.
Good morning. My name's Brad Francis. I'm the liturgist today. And I was at the theater last night, and then we had the, you know, daylight savings time so we can save electricity during World War I. And um, <laughs> so just if you see me yawning during the sermon, it's probably not Pastor Aaron's fault. Probably. You guys join me in the uh, call to worship. Yours will be in bold. In the midst of life's storms, God is there. What have we to fear here? In the darkness and terror, God is with us. Of whom shall we be afraid? Rise up, people of God, for you are loved and saved. All right, yeah, you can sit down. guys. I like that song. You guys join me in a prayer of illumination. Lord, I think most of us didn't get quite as much sleep as usual last night with the time change. And I just pray that today, as we 
open the scriptures and as we listen to what Pastor Aaron has to share with us, that you would help us to focus, help us to to just be drawn in to whatever message that you want us to receive this morning. Thank you for bringing us all here safely, and I thank you for the opportunity to get together to learn more about you and your word and just to care for each other. I love you, Lord, in your name I pray. Amen. All right, our scripture reading comes from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. That day, when evening came, he, Jesus, said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Good morning. This is children's time, so come on down. Good morning, Sam. So I want to know who's been on a boat before. Have you been on a boat? Yeah. Tell me some rules when you're on a boat. Anybody know a rule when you're on a boat? Mm-hmm. You have to have a life jacket. Um, good one. Have to have a life jacket on. Thank you. Yes, sir. No standing when the, when the boat is moving. No standing when the motor is on or if the boat is moving. Very good. Jimmy, you got one for me? Mm-hmm. Some people have a rule on their boats that they're not allowed to eat Cheetos or Doritos on their boats because it gets into the leather on the seats. You ever heard that one? Yeah. So, um, so in this story in the Bible, Jesus is on a boat with his friends, the disciples, and it's very windy, and the water is very choppy, and so the disciples start passing out their life jackets, and they put them on, and they're still nervous. Oh, boy, are they nervous. And so they go wake Jesus up, and they're like, Jesus! Jesus! Help us! <laughs> and he wakes up, and you know what he does? He goes to the edge of the boat, and he looks out at the water, and he says, peace be still. Can you say that? Very good. And then the wind stops, and the waves become calm, and the Bible tells us that the scripture was as smooth as glass. Can you make your hands as smooth as glass? (coughs) Very smooth, very smooth. Now... That was very comforting and very wonderful for the, for the disciples. And they got to see how strong and how brave and how helpful Jesus was when they were scared. I have another thing that's kind of like a life jacket, and it's over here. Come with me. These things are called prayer shawls, and you've done this before, right? These are kind of like life jackets because you put them on when you're feeling nervous or when you are feeling scared, or if the boat motor is on. And they help you to remember that God is with you, and that God will keep you safe, and that God will give you peace, and that God loves you. So what we're going to do today is we're going to bless these prayer shawls so that People in our congregation who are lonely or sick or having owies or when they're scared, they can remember that our church loves them and that their God loves them. Will you pray with me? Dear God, Dear God thank you for this day. For this day. Be, with us Be with us in the storm, in the storm. 
and in the sun. Be with all those who are sick or sad or lonely or in pain. Be their peace in the midst of the storm. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, boys and girls. Boys, all boys. Um, you may take your prayer shawls off, and I'm going to send you back to your seats. And then a little bit later, you may come up and help me with communion if you'd like. Thank you so much. In the Gospel of Mark, we find this story of the disciples in a boat with Jesus. They're on the Sea of Galilee, which we know is this thin place and this home base of his earthly ministry. And Jesus has been busy. He's been out and about. He's been preaching and teaching. He's been working and healing, and he is exhausted, So while they're out at sea and the sun is shining, he goes and he takes a nap. I don't know of a much greater thing than a nap on a boat. Do you? He's sound asleep in the midst of the storm, and yet something starts to rouse him from his sleep. He hears the cries of his beloveds. The disciples are crying loudly, demanding Jesus' attention. A storm has come up on the lake. It came quick and fast and furious, and now they're desperate and scared. They weren't prepared. They come banging into the room like bulls in a china shop. They're already wearing their life jackets that were stowed underneath their seat cushions. And the disciple with the bullhorn sounds the alarm and shares an urgent update. We don't have a lot of dialogue in the story in the Gospel of Mark that the words swamped and drowning stick out. The situation seems rather bleak and intense. And the disciples really, really need Jesus to do something. Jesus is compassionate, he cares for the disciples, he listens to them, and he's ready to respond. He's got some experience being in the wilderness, and he understands that this is the time to rally his spiritual strength, to witness to the power of God, and to be the Savior and the Messiah He stands up, he goes to the edge of the boat, and he speaks truth to power. He speaks to the storm. The great American poet Mary Oliver says this about the scene. Sweet Jesus, talking his melancholy madness, stood up in the boat and the sea lay down, silky and sorry. So everybody was saved that night. Jesus is the rescuer and the savior in this scene. He knows what heaven on earth looks like. And for these disciples who want to be in heaven and not on this rocky, nausea-inducing boat, heaven looks like a peaceful sea. 
Jesus knows how to transform turbulent waters into peaceful dwelling places. He knows how to manifest hope in the midst of despair. He knows how to lead those who are lost. And most of all, Jesus knows that his faith has command over the chaos and that he is the captain of this ship. The calm after the storm becomes a thin space. It becomes this place where wild imagination about who God is and what God is capable of is now in our mind's eye because we've seen it firsthand. Jesus' presence ushers in peace and it restores order. He rebukes the wind and the raging waves. In the blink of an eye, the disciples see Jesus, who is the Lord of all creation. They see that he has authority and dominion over all the earth. Now the thing is, the disciples, they seem to have this need for Jesus to perform miracles, to substantiate the claim that our God is greater, our God is stronger, our God is higher than any other. The disciples were struggling with trust. Mm. Have you ever been there? In the midst of the storm, struggling with trust, wondering when Jesus is going to rise up and be the rescuer, the savior that we need. Jesus gives them just enough rope to hang on. He rebukes the wind and the waves. He stands there in the stillness, in the silence, while all is calm and peaceful and tranquil. And then he calls them to task. He says, why are you so afraid? Have you no faith? This is Jesus' teachable moment. He's a rabbi after all. And he wants the disciples, his followers, his wingmen, the people who will carry on his movement to remember to have faith and hold on. The disciples were being asked to grow and stretch their faith in this instance. They were heading into deep waters, metaphorically and literally, in the Sea of Galilee. They were about to depart that place where they had been with Jesus and go south to Jerusalem. 150 miles south is the place where Jesus would be put to trial, where he would die on a cross. Yes, the disciples were heading into the deep waters. They were heading to the place where they were going to have to have faith, where they were going to have to hold on. We remember that the resurrection took three days. And so they were going to have to have faith and hold on and rest in the knowledge that God's reign is over this upside-down kingdom. Jesus is the one who will make a way out of no way. Jesus is the one who can and shall and will make all things well. There's a piece of art that drives this home for me, and I want to show it to you today on the screen. It's a piece of modern art called Peace Be Still by a Chinese-American artist called James He Ki. In this painting, you can see the white dove flying over Jesus' head. It harkens back to two stories from the Old Testament, both in the book of Genesis. The creation story is where we learn that the Spirit of God hovers over the chaotic waters. And then a few chapters later is the story of the great flood, where we see a dove bringing back an olive leaf to Noah as a sign that the waters have receded and new life is possible. 
Jesus' arms are outstretched wide, and his face is gentle and inviting. His robe is the same color as a rainbow or our stained glass windows here in this sanctuary. There's no dialogue visible, his lips aren't moving, but it seems like he's saying, we're all in this together, I know your past, I see your future. Jesus was first a Jew. He was raised in Judaism and he knew the stories of creation. He knew the story of Noah and the great flood from studying the Torah all of his life. So now in this painting, the artist is calling upon those lessons once again. Have faith, hold on. I was with you in the midst of creation, in the dark and formless void, when the Spirit was sweeping over the waters. And I was with you once again when you were in the deep waters, when it rained for years. And then I brought back life. We're all in this together. I know your past. I see your future. Have faith. Hang on. Perhaps the reason that Jesus woke the disciples from his sweet slumber is because they felt vulnerable in the midst of the storm. Perhaps they thought in calling upon Jesus, who is the great Coast Guard, he would show up and start doling out instructions that would help them navigate to safety. Perhaps they thought they'd done the best they could, but the storm was raging and they were goners. The boat was flooded and they were going down beneath the waves. And so if they were to have faith and hold on, they wanted to hold Jesus' hand. They needed and wanted to be with their Savior, even if things were awful and scary and tense. Jesus says, of course you can hold my hand. Of course I will be with you in the storm. I am with you always. And so in that moment, he exits his peaceful boat nap. He leaves the stern and he goes to the bow of the boat and he starts talking to the powers that be. He starts engaging with the conflict, with the difficulties, with the trials and tribulations. He gathers the disciples once they have found their equilibrium and sure footing. He says, this is what it's like to have faith. Sometimes there will be storms and sometimes the waters will be calm. I'm with you each and every day in the midst of all those situations. My friends, for us in the midst of this Lenten season, we're being asked to brave the thin places. The storm is one of those thin places because we remember how desperate we are as God's beloved to be held in his embrace, to be held in that safe refuge of a place until we can find our equilibrium and our peace. This Lent, we're clinging to that hope that we have in Jesus, who is our redemption and our resurrection. And so no matter what kind of storm we are living in right now, we remember that we can brave that thin place, that we can go to Jesus with all of our needs, with all of our anxieties, with all of our cares and concerns, that he will hold our hand and he will rise up. I wonder for you if the storm feels like something we know here in Michigan. 
Maybe it's visible at a distance. The sky is heavy and dark and foreboding. But oh, does it make us nervous. What in your life can you see coming down the pike that gives you pause and makes you want to pray? Maybe, perhaps, it's like a tornado. The storm has whipped you around and left you in shambles, needing to put the pieces of life back together. Perhaps the storm is like a torrential rain that beats down and just keeps coming and has flooded your spirit, and now you're up to your eyeballs where you don't know if you can take any more. Maybe the storm is more like snow, and there's whiteout conditions. You're not able to see what's coming next. There's a whole lot of unknowns, and the road feels treacherous. In the midst of all of these situations, we know that we can turn to Jesus that he will answer our call, that he will hear our cry, that he will listen to our prayers, and that he will rise up to be our Savior. Just as he is there for us, he's going to call us to task. He's going to say, I am with you always. Have faith. Hold on. We're going to get through this. So in that spirit, I want to teach you a little um, prayer activity that you can use when you're in the storm. This is a mindfulness exercise and a form of meditation. And I want you to take your hands, palms face up, and I want you to tap your your thumb to each finger, pointer, middle, ring, and then pinky. Perhaps if you're someone with long thumbnails, it might feel good to sort of dig your thumbnail in to the tip of each finger. And then I'm going to give you a word to match with each touch. We're going to say, have faith, hold on. Are you with me? Have faith, hold on. Good. Now we're going to do it in silence as an act of prayer. So take a big, deep breath in and let it out. And in your mind's eye, go to that place in your life that feels stormy, that place that feels insecure, that place where you want Jesus to rise up. And then pray that prayer with me and move your fingers one at a time. Have faith. Hold on. Now see if you can match your breath with the prayer. Inhale. Have faith. Hold on. Let it out. One more time. Inhale, have faith, hold on. Good and gracious God, your presence extends to us in every time and in every place. You know right where we are this morning in our body and in our mind and in our spirit. You're cradling us in your arms and you're holding us in your loving embrace. Oh God, that's real good, because some of us have got our life preservers on, and some of us are shaken in our knees. We're worried about our family members and our friends, our finances, our health, our car, our mortgage payment, our grandkids. We're worried about the state of education and violence on our city streets. Climate change keeps us up at night, oh God, and oh yeah, there's a war raging. 
God, we know that we need to have faith and hold on. So we come to you today with praise and with prayer, with arms reaching out. We ask, O oh God, that you would meet us here, that you would pull us in and take our hand, that your presence might be as strong and sure today as it was for the disciples who were in the boat, and that we might remember that you are with us always. Oh God, we're so grateful for the incarnate love and mercy that you give to us in your Son, Jesus Christ. We know that we need his love and his mercy every day. And so now we pause to remember and to confess to you the mistakes that we have made, the sins that we have committed, the things we have said that we should not have said, and the harm we have done. Just as quickly as we can recall these instances, O oh God, where we carry guilt and shame, we also remember to have faith and to hold on, and we know that your grace is greater than any of our sin. We'll meet that grace here at your table, O Lord. And so we pray that you would wipe our slate clean, that you would reconcile us and make us whole. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, who first taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Just as Jesus taught us to pray, he also taught us how to feast. And so today we will gather at the Lord's table to feast with the sacrament of Holy Communion. As we do so, we remember that this altar table does not belong to Marshall United Methodist. It belongs to Jesus Christ. And so in that spirit, all people are welcome. You need not be a member of this church or any church all you need to do is be seeking God's grace today. In the story that we find in 1 Corinthians, we remember the way in which Jesus gathered in the upper room with his disciples and how they shared a meal together. There was conversation, there was laughter, there were tears, there were stories. And at the end of the meal, Jesus took the bread and he lifted it up and he blessed it and he gave thanks to God for it. And then he shared it with his disciples, saying, this is my body. As often as you eat of this, please remember me. In the same way, Jesus took one of the cups that was on the table he took the third cup that still had wine in it. It represented life and love and his promise that he would pour himself out for us. He would make sacrifices. He would stretch himself so that we might know the extent of God's great love. After he blessed the cup, he shared it with all those who were gathered, saying, as often as you drink of this, please remember me. Will you pray with me?
Holy God, just as you were present in the upper room with Jesus and his disciples, we pray that you would come into this space. We pray that you would make this altar table a thin space where your heaven would come close to our earth, where your grace would meet our guilt, and where your love would find every person who is seeking it. Transform these ordinary elements of bread and juice. Make them be something extraordinary for us, that we might remember your Son and all he has done. Amen. As we bless these elements today, we also bless the elements that will be shared in our community with our seniors who are homebound and shut in. And we know that we participate in the sacrament of Holy Communion with the whole body of Christ all around the world. Will the smallest members of the body of Christ please come forward to help me serve, as well as our communion stewards? Thank you. You may hold that. Morning, Jimmy. Come here. Jimmy. Here's him. Right there. Well, he's he's going to hold it as a symbol. Okay. Julia, I'm going to have you stand with the kids. Good. You can help them say the words. Body of Christ, broken for you. Good. Okay. Charlie's going to serve the form. What are you going to do? No. Is that appropriate behavior? Are you going to be in front of the whole church and do that?
This morning, if you have a prayer request, you are invited to fill out one of these orange cards, which you can find in the black folders in your pews. If you're worshiping with us online, feel free to just leave a comment on our Facebook stream, or as you're filling out your connection card, you can also leave prayer requests there. We will certainly be praying for all of these things and for all those unspoken prayers as well. It is time for our morning offering now, uh, and we want to remind you of the many ways that you can be generous and be a good steward and support uh, the life and the mission of Marshall United Methodist Church. You can place your donation donation or your offering in the donation station in the back of the sanctuary. You can drop off your offering at the uh, 24-hour drop-off box at our north entrance, or there are several ways that you can give electronically. There is a phone number that you can text. Uh, There is a QR code uh, that you can scan that will take you directly to our webpage, umcmarshall.org. All of that information is also on the donation station as you drop off your offering. We thank you so much for your generosity. Oh, or there it is. Hello. We thank you for your generosity as you support and uh, continue to to give to what is going on here at Marshall UMC. Thanks. pray together one more time. Lord, this is uh, called the prayer of thanksgiving, and yet if I listed all the things we have to be grateful for, we would never go home. So let me just thank you for being there, for being there in the storm, for being there when we need you most, for never being surprised by the things that take us completely off guard for always being able to calm the winds and the waves so that we don't drown. I love you, Lord. Thank you for bringing us together today. In your name I pray. Amen. Oh. Yeah, we're going to sing our closing hymn now. 512, stand by me. Yeah, 512. I'm not very good at this.
have you all be seated for our closing announcements today. We have spent the month of February learning about movies and anti-racism, and we also have seen ourselves as a nation and as a state and as a community affected by gun violence. And so coming out of all of those things in, in cumulative effect is an event this week called Letters and Lemon Bars. And I want to invite one of our leaders, Kaylee Hill, to come and share about that event and how you can participate in it. Aaron, is this on? There it is. Okay. <laughs> so um, as Pastor Aaron said, we're going to have an event this Tuesday um, to write letters um, in support of ending gun violence in Michigan. Um, this is in accordance with the Michigan State, um, Michigan Conference of United Methodist Church. And last year after the Oxford High School shooting, our conference overwhelmingly voted to support this particular initiative. In 2020, gun violence became the number one cause of death of children under the age of 18. That is still the case today in 2023. We are asking for guns to be locked away in safe storage in homes that have children. Because it's not the publicized school shootings actually that caused that statistic to be so high, it's accidental deaths and suicide. Also, this is kind of a surprise to me, in Michigan, current law does not hold the same rules for all weapons. Long guns are not regulated to the same rules as a handgun. You do not have to have a license or a background check to purchase a long gun in a private sale in Michigan. We are asking to change that and make them the same. And did you know that in homes where there is domestic violence and a gun, it is 500 times more likely, or 500% more likely, that a murder will occur. This occurs for 15, per, this accounts for 15% of all violent crime in America. So we are asking for red, was it red flag laws? To um, temporarily remove homes from situations that are deemed dangerous by a court of law and to ban gun sales and purchases or ownership of people who have been convicted of domestic violence. So if this is something that interests you, um, this Tuesday at 1 o'clock, or March 14th, I'm making lemon bars and inviting you all to join us to write letters and in support of this to our Congress people. We will have all the supplies for you, um, so just show up. We have, we have letters, we have templates, we have stamps and envelopes and all that. We have addresses. So um, you can do that. If Tuesday does not work for you, then next week, week after church on the 19th uh, between both services and after the second service, you can also um, join us. If none of those work for you, then by all means contact Pastor Aaron or myself and we will get you all the information you need um, to do it at home. Um, hope to see you guys there. Thanks. We live our faith as advocates for peace and justice, and so all are welcome to Letters and Lemon Bars. You are also welcome to attend our mission dinner on Wednesday evening this week from 5 to 6.30 p.m. We're offering dine-in and take-out service. If you'd like a to-go box, you can call the church office to set that up. Now you will you receive this blessing. May the God who is with you in the storm stand by you. May you have faith and hold on, knowing that he will be there. Amen.